Even years later, I can't forget that summer night and the sheer terror that took hold of me somewhere out on that dark, lonely highway. It still sends chills down my spine just thinking about it. The two-lane road we were traveling on had originally been hacked through the dense forest back in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps to connect a series of small logging towns and settlements that had sprung up in the area. Those rough-hewn frontier villages had enjoyed a few decades of prosperity harvesting the plentiful timber before sawmills began closing down one by one as the woods were cleared. Over time, the towns were abandoned as opportunities dried up, leaving behind derelict buildings, equipment graveyards, and idle mills that were gradually swallowed by the relentless growth of new underbrush and fauna reclaiming its territory. Now those forgotten ghost towns remained only as crumbling ruins and whispered stories about the hard-living loggers, hermits, and vagabonds who had once made this isolated forest their home. I was 16 years old that summer and couldn't wait to get out of the suburbs of Chicago for a little adventure with my family. My dad had been busting his tail working overtime for months to be able to afford our big road trip vacation out west. Mom spent ages researching all the best routes, hotels, and national parks to hit along the way. My little sister was nine and still bubbly with youthful enthusiasm about everything. She'd been babbling non-stop about all the mountains, forests, and wildlife we might see. My little brother was 13 and trying his best to act too cool for family road trips, but I could tell he was excited too, underneath his aloof facade. It was well after midnight when we finally loaded up the old Chevy Suburban and headed out. The AC was busted so we had all the windows down, the warm summer air whipping our faces. An old 90s rock CD played through the crackling speakers as the city faded away behind us. The open road stretched out endlessly, a ribbon of darkness illuminated only by our high beams. My sister didn't make it more than an hour before she was knocked out in the back seat, head against the window. My brother and I did our best to stay awake, watching the hypnotic lines on the road flashing by under the dim glow of the dome light. That's when I saw it. A fleeting shape, blacker than the night itself, amidst the tightly packed trees lining the highway. For just an instant, illuminated in the sweep of the headlights, I could have sworn I saw the silhouette of a man, perfectly still, wearing some kind of broad-rimmed hat. I must have gasped or made some noise because my dad glanced over. I stammered, blinking hard. My brother peered out the window, trying to follow my gaze. Nothing, I guess. Never mind. The image had vanished as quickly as it appeared. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been watching us from the tree line. Hour after hour, I strained my eyes, searching the shadows outside whenever a road sign indicated another isolated stretch of highway but I didn't see anything more. Until at last we reached our hotel. As my exhausted family dragged themselves inside, I lingered for a moment, giving one last look at the dense stand of pines across the road. That's when I saw it again, that unnatural stillness, that inky black silhouette crowned with a wide-brimmed hat, unmoving except for a slight twist of the head, like it knew I could see it. I didn't say a word, didn't breathe, just turned and hurried inside after my family, trying to convince myself that my eyes were just playing tricks after too many endless hours on the road. But I knew what I saw, and part of me will always wonder if something was out there in the darkness between the trees, watching our car as we drove by. Marking us, for what, I can't imagine. I've never told anyone about it. Every time we went on another road trip after that, I kept a tight watch on the tree lines gliding past my window, dreading that I might see that unnatural figure again. But maybe it's better that I didn't. There are some things we aren't meant to understand. No matter how hard I tried, I could never seem to forget the bizarre experience I had driving home from work that night. It was another grueling night at the end of an endless string of 16-hour workdays. I was an investment banker, and our team had been burning the midnight oil for weeks to close a huge corporate acquisition deal. Mistakes weren't an option. One tiny oversight could cost the firm millions. My eyes felt grainy and dry as I pored over the financial models and legal contracts one more time, making sure every number and comma was perfect. My neck and shoulders were in knots from being hunched over my laptop. But I couldn't complain. 
The fat paycheck I pulled down was the only way I could afford the new house in the suburbs for my wife and kids. Finally, a little after 2 a.m., I hit send on the last few emails and headed for the parking garage. I was utterly spent, both mentally and physically. My brain felt like mush as I fumbled for my car keys. I dragged myself into the driver's seat, started the engine, and began the hour-long slog home through the deserted city streets. Knowing I needed to stay alert, I stopped for a large black coffee loaded with an extra shot of espresso. The roads were quiet, mainly just semis and other overworked corporate drones like myself heading home at this late hour. I turned up the radio, blasting the heavy bass to keep me alert. But it was no use. After the third or fourth yawn in just a few minutes, my eyelids began to droop heavily. I shook my head vigorously, trying to fight off the fog of exhaustion clouding my mind. That's when I started drifting across the line into the opposite lane. Just then, a faint whisper came from the back seat. Wake up. I jumped, snapping fully awake as a chill ran down my spine. There was no one else in the car. My heart was pounding out of my chest. Taking deep breaths, I tried to calm myself down. It must have just been my deprived mind playing tricks on me. But then something made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I slammed on the brakes, tires screeching, but I couldn't see what had caused my panic. The dark road stretched out ominously in front of me, empty. That whisper, whatever its source, was enough to shock me back to full alertness. I didn't dare let myself drift off again after that. I kept the radio blasting and the windows down, letting the cold night air sting my face and keep me awake for the rest of the white-knuckled drive home. I never did find an explanation for that eerie voice. Maybe it was just auditory hallucination brought on by fatigue. Or maybe... I tried not to let my mind linger on more supernatural possibilities. Regardless of what caused it, I was just thankful that whisper woke me up when it did. Otherwise, I could have drifted across the line at full speed, leading to a devastating head-on collision. I shuddered at the thought. Whatever or whoever it was, it just may have saved my life. After that harrowing experience, I vowed to never again get behind the wheel feeling anywhere close to that exhausted. Even if I had to pull an all-nighter at the office, I would call a car service to get home safely. The potential consequences of fatigue driving were just too dire. That mysterious whisper was a wake-up call, literally, that I couldn't ignore. My friend and I were on our way home from a metal concert we had been looking forward to for months. I was really into hardcore and thrash metal bands back in high school. The distorted guitars, fast drum beats, and aggressive vocals really resonated with my rebellious teenage spirit. We were exhausted but amped up from the show as we drove down the dark, deserted highway long past midnight. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a shadowy figure walking slowly along the side of the road up ahead. As we got closer, the beams of our headlights illuminated a young woman wearing a floral sundress that seemed oddly out of place for a night this cold and dreary. In her hand, she carried a small, worn suitcase. She appeared tired and defeated, her shoulders slumped forward as she put one foot in front of the other. I felt a pang of sympathy for her, stuck out here alone on this long, lonesome highway so late at night. I suggested to Mike, my buddy who was driving, that we pull over and offer her a ride. He was reluctant at first, but finally gave in after I insisted it was the right thing to do. We pulled up alongside her slowly and I called out through the passenger window, Hey, do you need a ride? She turned and the first thing I noticed were her eyes, bloodshot and filled with primal fear. She nodded anxiously and got into the back seat without uttering a single word. I introduced myself and my friends, but she just stared blankly ahead, clutching her suitcase. As we drove along, my friend mentioned that he had heard a legend about a ghost hitchhiker being spotted along this very road over the years. Some said she had died tragically in a car crash in the 60s. Others claimed she was murdered by a jealous lover. Either way, sightings of her phantom hitchhiking figure were well known in these parts. I got chills as we realized we might have just picked up that infamous ghost. As we drove, she remained silent. Every so often, I'd catch her eyes in the rearview mirror, wide and terrified. We tried making small talk to put her at ease, but she never spoke. The quiet was uncomfortable, and we couldn't wait to get to town to drop her off. Finally, we saw some lights up ahead. A small gas station came into view, the only sign of life for miles. I turned and let the woman know we were almost there. But when I looked back, the seat was empty. She was gone. No sign of her or the suitcase she'd been holding so tightly. My heart dropped into my stomach as I whipped my head around, scanning the back seat frantically. 
How could she just disappear like that? Mike's eyes went wide in the rearview mirror as the realization hit him too. We pulled over immediately and got out to search the car, tearing apart the back seats, checking under the seats, popping the trunk. But there was no trace of her. I stood there, dumbfounded, running my hands through my hair. My mind raced as I tried to make sense of what just happened. One minute she was sitting silently behind us, the next, poof, she had vanished into thin air like a phantom. Was this paranormal? Or had we somehow imagined the whole thing after being out so late? But we had both seen her, clear as day under the headlights when we picked her up. Her haunting, fearful eyes were seared into my memory. A shiver went down my spine as I recalled the story Mike had mentioned about the ghost hitchhiker. Suddenly it all seemed menos coincidental. Had we really just encountered that urban legend come to life on this very road? Overwhelmed with confusion and more than a little spooked, we got back in the car, peeling out of there as quickly as we could. As we drove off into the night, I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see her reappear, forever etched into the back seat like an unsolved riddle. From that night on, we never took that same stretch of highway home again, always opting for an alternate route. The experience shook us both so deeply that we couldn't bring ourselves to risk running into that ghostly woman twice. Better to just avoid it altogether than tango with the supernatural ever again.